Well, that ain't good. Welcome back to the shop and to the channel. On the previous video, we finished machining the sole of this 18 inch cast iron straight edge. Well, we did run into some issues with the work holding, just trying to figure out the right way to hold it. But we got those squared away, and I think we've got a pretty good flat surface, at least according to my surface plate for now. And of course, the ultimate goal is to scrape this flat so I can use it as a reference when I go to scrape some precision machinery I have that I want to restore. So let's go back over to the milling machine, get this set up to start machining the prism face. With the machining of the sole complete, I went ahead and have it set up now to machine the prism face. I also spent a bunch of time making sure the head was knotted to as close to 45 degrees as possible now. I decided to give the brass domes here another try. I've got one under the right side and I have two over here on the left side. And again, the idea is if it's clamped in this orientation, it's in a plane and there won't be any twist in it. I have a Starrett surface gauge here that I'm just using as an additional sort of visual check just to make sure that this is parallel with the mill table. With everything now clamped and secure to the mill table, I've also got my tattletale dial indicators on each end, fire up the mill and touch off and take a shallow 10 thousandths cut uh, across the face of the prism. I fully expected to see a cut like this where I was going to be removing more material on the converging edge than the top of the prism face and that's just because we already know that this angle as it was cast is not exactly 45 degrees yet. Well, it stopped cutting here before we got to the end of the prism face, so we'll stop the mill and we'll move it back down to the left side and we'll take another pass. more passes later here we still haven't quite cleaned up the entire prism face on the upper right hand side we're taking cuts of about 15 thousandths total depth We 
you can see, I still haven't quite cleaned up this upper right hand corner of the prism face. So what I'm going to do when this pass is finished, I'm going to take some measurements to see if maybe I need to do a little bit of adjusting to see if I can't get this cleaned up without taking too much material off the other end. Well, after taking some quick measurements here of the length of the prism face as well as the depth of the sole, um, comparing the left to the right side, it does look like I am taking off more material on the left than I am the right. Remembering that I'm using a couple of one, two, three blocks as a backstop behind the straight edge, it's probably not that unusual or unexpected considering it's a rough casting back there. Well, because I didn't take that into account, I've taken off more on the left than the right, about 115 thousandths of an inch total depth on the prism face. So I'm going to need to make some adjustments. Well, I don't have any shim stock that I could stick back here, but I've got a couple of old packs of feeler gauges so what I'm going to do is just kind of jam them back behind the straight edge between it and the one two three block so taking two 30 thou feeler gauges back between the one two three block and the straight edge on this right side should move it out the sixty thousandths that I want and should end up giving me a more true prism face. Well, it does mean I'm going to need to reset my zero here on the right end. And as I traverse back to the left, I won't be taking as much off on the left side until we even out the right. So it looks like I can start my cut almost a full third of the way in on the left hand side in order to start evening out the depth of the sole between the left and the right. Well, I've evened out the depth of the sole between the left and the right, so I am getting a good straight cut along the front of the straight edge. I just need to keep taking some roughing passes until we've cleaned up that converging edge. Well, the roughing passes on the prism face are complete and now switched back over to that ground insert with the sharper cutting edge and slowed my feed rate down about 50% in order to get a really nice surface finish on this front face. And like I did when I finished machining the sole, I'm going to loosen the clamps here just to ensure that I've removed any kind of internal stress or warp that could have been introduced by the pressure of the clamps. And we'll take one or two finishing passes.
this will be the final pass, final finishing cut on the prism face. Well, the machining on the prism face is complete so we can remove the clamps and take it over to the bench. Well, I'm not quite done with the machining of this piece, but I do want to take it over to the bench here and just give it a little stoning just to knock down some of the burrs here and check this front edge. I'll eventually be taking a file to the front edge and giving it a nice radius. It does not need to be sharp at all. Well, I'm getting ready to go ahead and machine the top of the straight edge. We're going to turn it 180 degrees so the back of it's facing me now. I'm going to go ahead and use those brass domes again to try and get a nice level surface so when I do cut the top it should be fairly close to parallel to the bottom. This is proving to be as challenging to set up as it was for the sole and the front. Trying to get those brass domes lined up in a position to where I can place a toe clamp directly between and over them. And I have these other pieces of brass that I'm trying to get again to be either over top of the single dome or right between the two on the left. And of course the goal here is to try to even out the force from the toe clamps between all three of those points so that I don't introduce any twist um, into the straight edge which will ultimately affect the level of precision if not the time that it's going to take to scrape it flat. I'm also clamping down here some stop blocks on the ends of the straight edge. Again, this just minimizes any kind of chance that the straight edge can move. It doesn't eliminate it completely, but at least it minimizes it. The last thing I'm going to do is set up my tattletale dial gauges just as a visual confirmation that the machining hasn't shifted the straight edge at all. After finding the high spot and touching off, I moved the cutter all the way down to the right edge and I'm just taking a 10,000th depth of cut just to make sure that I did find the high spot that I don't take off too much at one time. With that first pass finished, I'm going to raise the knee 25 thousandths and take a second pass. Well, I'm glad I didn't walk away from the machine at all because within the first four inches there, 
the entire straight edge started to rock under the forces of the face mill. Although unfortunate, not a complete disaster, this is completely recoverable. While I only have myself to blame here, obviously, I'm the only one in the room, but I really didn't feel 100% comfortable using those brass domes in this setup. It just didn't feel right, and I should have stopped and thought about it a little bit longer. Well, rather than risk any more problems, I'm going to remove these clamps and ditch those brass domes. Well, without those three points of contact, I am certainly going to be increasing the risk that I'll add a twist or some other kind of deformation to the straight edge under clamping. I'm just going to have to hope that I did my job when I milled the sole that it's flat enough that using these clamps here won't introduce any additional twist. Well, now that everything's a little bit lower than it was before, I'm going to need to touch off again and then reset my zero before finishing the milling operation on this top. This should be my final roughing pass for the top and we'll come back with the fly cutter after this. Machining cast iron is a double edged sword. It machines really easy, it's nice, it doesn't make a lot of noise or smoke but man has it ever spit out these little chips and fine dust particles of cast iron everywhere. With the roughing passes complete, I'm coming back now with the fly cutter. Not just a single ten thousandths pass with that ground insert that should leave me with a really good surface finish. As I get close to the end of this cut, this first cut, um, I'm certainly glad I was able to notice a pretty big mistake that I had made when I started it that could have resulted in a rather catastrophic crash. Well, I was running the fly cutter down the center of this top like I normally would and after just a few inches into it, not even maybe two inches into the cut, I realized that if I kept moving that way, the fly cutter was going to smack right into one of the studs that are in the clamp holding the straight edge down. I'm just glad that I noticed it before it was too late.
with the machining yeah. finished on the top I wanted to take some measurements just to see how consistent the thickness of <clears throat> the straight edge is across Three, its length. One. Well the difference between the left side and the right side is about two ten thousandths of an inch, which is respectable. Two to there, that's I can deal with. But the center oh, comes up about a thousandth so of an inch, thou and a half higher than the outside edges. 342. I think I can simply so attribute that to the, the wear in the machine, mm -hmm. and I'm getting some sag in the table, which is raising each end as it's being machined. With that being said, I think I can scrape out a thousandths difference, so I don't think that's going to be a major issue, but in the meantime, I want to machine the front and the back of this top rail. So I'm going to remove the fly cutter and replace it with a three quarter inch end mill. I'll move the tool over to where I think the high spot is on the front. We'll touch off and we'll start machining it. So this front edge is pretty clean and consistent, so it shouldn't take too many passes before I've got a nice clean front edge with good corners. This will be the last pass for the front here and there's still going to be a little bit of cast raw casting showing however that's going to get machined away when I take care of the sides. Machining the back of the top rail should go just as I did for the front of it. I am really enjoying having this power draw bar. It does make tool changes a snap. I need to remove this end mill and replace it with a longer one that will enable me to machine the entire left and right sides of the straight edge. So to machine the left side of the straight edge, which since it's facing away from me, I'm considering this side the left side I need to move this stop block out of the way I'll just reposition it to the back to give me some stability forward and aft that way if the end mill decides to grab it really won't be able to move the straight edge from its position on the table I 
I don't expect this end mill to be the sharpest and there's quite a bit of stick out. So I am going to take this in multiple passes, but I do expect it to sing just a little bit. I expect to get some chatter off of this. We'll do the same machining on the right side that we did for the left, um, moving the stop block over to the front, which gives me a clear path to the entire surface. I have rearranged all the clamps here to give me access to the back of the sole. I'm going to use the same end mill and machine the back of the sole until I get a good clean surface and a good clean corner. Well, that's the extent of the machining that I'm going to be doing on the bridge port. There is still one more piece that I need to machine and we're going to take it over to the k &T horizontal mill to do that. Just below the top rail there is a finger groove on the straight edge and it's about a half of an inch diameter um, void in the casting and I am going to machine this here on the KMT using a half inch ball end mill in the horizontal spindle. I have the straight edge clamped directly to the table. It is clamped um, on the back strap over top of the webs. And then I have stop blocks on both ends to make sure that this part doesn't move. I have the spindle set to 550 RPM and we are advancing the table at three and a half inches per minute. Well, I'm only 
only takes a few passes to clean this up. I did run it down a couple of times and then I then raise the cutter, which is lowering the knee here, in order to clean up the top edge of the finger groove. Well, that's it for the machining on both the Bridgeport and the KT. We'll take it over to the bench. We'll give it a quick stone and a deburr, and we'll see what we ended up with. Well, this was a lot of fun to machine. I can't thank Dennis Foster enough for the guidance and the other folks on the Practical Machinist Forum. I got some really good input and advice. I didn't keep an accurate count, but if I had to guess, I have about 10 to 12 hours into machining this over four or five days. And I managed to record about five and a half hours each of two different cameras. Editing this thing down to a reasonable amount was actually quite the chore. I had so much fun machining this that if I had like a horizontal boring machine, I probably would have machined these webs too. I think I will add a little bit of color here inside the back where it's still raw casting and maybe highlight the lettering as well. Well, the next big thing to do with this is going to be to scrape it in to use it as a reference, but that's going to have to be for another video. Thanks for following along. Hit that like button. Subscribe if you're not a subscriber. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.